Okay, so let's start from some introduction. My name is Piotr Ziemcik. I'm working for the Nordic Semiconductor. And I'm internal code owner of the kernel in the Nordic, uh, which means that every patch uh, which goes from Nordic to the kernel has to be uh, reviewed by me. Today I will talk about the timeouts in Zephyr. We start with some teor theory. So we start, uh, we, I tell what are the timeouts in the Zephyr kernel and where you can find them. And then I will give you one real world example why the precision of these timeouts matters. After that, we will go to the uh, my, uh, main part of this presentation uh, when I show you some benchmark, uh, how the timeout subsystem in the Zephyr behaves, then present some uh, past, current, and future work planned for the uh, fixing the problems we identified during our benchmarking. So let's start with the, with the theory. If you ever, if, uh, even uh, try to use Zephyr in some even Hello World application, you'll note that there are several API calls which takes uh, some kind of the time as an argument. So you can sleep for several milliseconds, you can schedule timer over, uh, over some duration or period. You can have time out of the operation. All these API calls schedule a timeout inside the Zephyr kernel. And the kernel itself tracks the all individual timeouts and programs the system timer uh, in, uh, in order to get an interrupt when the given timeout, uh, timeout is expiring. And this interrupt allows you to handle something regardless of the state of the system. So the system may be idle, the system might execute something, uh, but when the timeout expires, something happens. A threat can be woken up, uh, some users, uh, user provide handler is called, work is submitted to our work queue, anything else. In general, the timeout should uh, be exactly at time when scheduled. However, this is not possible in practice. We have uh, CPUs which have finite speed, which and handling interrupt takes some time. Executing kernel code takes some time. So we cannot be exactly at the moment of timeout. But what we can do is we can be as close as possible, which means that when the interrupt is signaled, uh, the kernel takes some action and do the minimal work to do the something associated with the uh, timeout. What we cannot do is we cannot do uh, premature expiration, which means that uh, our timeout cannot expire before we schedule that, because with this, this will not allow for an, an, an real world uh, time and management. So the question, how to measure the quality of the timeouts? We can run some benchmark. We can try to measure some real value. We get some results represented by dots on the picture. And we can define the various properties of the subsystem. So the first property is accuracy. Accuracy tells you how close you are to real value. And regarding the timeouts and time measurements in embedded devices, this part is defined by the hardware uh, to be more uh, specific by the accuracy of the crystal or any other oscillator you are using to measure the time. The next property you have to verify is the resolution. The, resolutions, uh, uh, the resolutions is limited by the hardware. You will have one megahertz clock uh, on your system timer. Your resolution is limited to one microsecond because you are not able to distinguish two events happening within one microsecond. The operating system has only one task here. 
should not degrade hardware capabilities. So should, should uh, take everything that hardware provides and uh, not break it. And the last property is the precision. The precision tells you how close each measurement of the same things are each other. The hardware is always precise, which means that if you program the hardware to wait for four cycles, this will be always four cycles. The operating system should be precise too. However, handling all of these timeouts uh, is a lot of work. And this is the area when we are focusing. And uh, why the precision of timeouts really matters? Because I'm from Nordic, the example here will be Bluetooth. So if you know, probably know, there are protocols called Bluetooth Low Energy. And it's low energy because it tries to minimize the radio usage, which means that the peripheral side, receiving side on the picture, turns the radio receiver only when it has to exchange the data. The central part on the picture, this is transmitter, periodically asks the peripheral if, it's, uh, if the peripheral has something to send. When receiver is on, in our chip, it consumes 20 milliampers of power. However, the budget for the devices built around our chip is four microamp for whole chip of average power consumption. And the radio scheduling on the high level looks simple. However, we have to take under account some limitations. The first limitation is the clock drift on the transmitter side that the transmitter will not transmit exactly at four, every four seconds because the crystal used in the transmitter have some accuracy, which means that all timeouts scheduled by the transmitter device have also accuracy and we can shift the pulse, which means that we have to take that under account on the receiver side, uh, widening the receiving window. The same happens on the receiver side. We are not synchronized through common clock. We have own oscillator. This oscillator has some properties. One of these is accuracy. And we have widened the receiving, win receiving window in order to take under account this drift too. On top of that, this is software overhead. Uh, when we have a timeout, we have some, some time is needed to handle that timeout. And some time is needed to turn on the radio which means that you have, we have to take under account that overhead and schedule the timeout a bit earlier. And our receiving window is wider. And whenever this receiving window is wider, the more power we are consuming. While the real part when the receiving, receiving happens is still the same. So in this example, uh, we can clearly see of coloration between the precision of the timeouts in the system and some high-level quality benchmark of the system like power usage. So if this is so important for us, let's do some benchmark and check how the Zephyr behaves. So we created a very simple benchmark which runs the 100 tests of the K-Timer API, which are shifted by some fixed amount of the time by the key busy weight. In case of our SOC, the key busy weight is not using the timeout infrastructure on the Zephyr, and we know that it's precise because it basically spins waiting for the hardware, so uh, all timeouts are, uh, are close to each other and as, as accurate as possible. The K-Timer uh, uses the uh, Zephyr timeout subsystem, and this is the part we are going to benchmark. And we also benchmarked the K-Microsleep API, as this allows us to use the shorter periods of time in like, because it accepts argument in the microseconds. So if we stated the benchmark like that, this is our ideal result. So basically, 
you see that the time spent in the KBZ white plus time spent in the cat timer exactly matches with our timer. And this is ideal result. This will not happen. What will happen is that, uh, uh, what, what can happen in the real uh, system is that we will be slight beyond the target because there is some execution between the running of these two tests and this, there is some overhead. But let's look about the results. Here is the result of the, this benchmark taken about half a year ago. Uh, as you see, most of the timeouts uh, ended prematurely before our target. The uh, uh, difference is very small, but we are basically violating one of the principles of the timeout API in an operating system. You have to expire at the time or a later, and if you are expiring the later, all the uh, all the delay have to be explained somehow. The second part, as uh, the second part you can look, is that from time to time, from one test to another, we have a spike. We are expiring a way too long, uh, to, uh, way late, later than we intended to. And this is something also bad because uh, this delay is not uh, justified by anything. System had plenty of time to schedule the timeout, to, uh, to, to handle the timeout, but from time to time it to, uh, took way longer than expected. The worst situation is in K microsleep. We try to sleep for one microsecond. Uh, the higher time was 10 milliseconds, more than 10 milliseconds. This was because of the tick of 10 milliseconds at the time, the default tick. However, you still see that it's not bound to the tick, which is 10 milliseconds. It's bound to, ver uh, to much higher value, which is more than uh, 12 milliseconds. There are good things. All of this is now fixed. During that investigation, we uh, identified some problems and these problems are, for most of the part, fixed. Which means that now Zephyr allows us to set the uh, very high tick rate, which increases the resolution from 10 milliseconds to 30 and half microseconds in case of our chip. The next problem we identified is by adding or removing timeouts. So for example, scheduling the, the K timer in one thread, you could delay an existing timeout indefinitely. This problem is also already solved. Also, we found some hardware-specific bugs uh, when the software don't, uh, did not take uh, under consideration some uh, hardware, uh, hardware capabilities and hardware limitations. One of that limitation is that you cannot schedule the timeout for the next cycle of the system timer on various hardware. You have to take under account that there is a minimal timeout you can schedule. This is now handled. But this was very easy part. There are some dragons there. And I show you in this presentation only one dragon, but with two heads. The one head is called unit, and the second head is the rounding. And let's consider one uh, system you are building. And because you would like to measure some, some time with the millisecond precision, you said you, that your system will use 1,000 ticks per second, which means that one tick in the Zephyr kernel equals to one millisecond. However, you would like to use the Nordic hardware, and the Nordic hardware uses the uh, lowest power oscillator we have in the system for the system timer, which uses the crystal from the typical clock. And because hardware are, is not used, system timer is not using floating point, every delay have to be, uh, have to be programmed in integer number of the hardware cycles. 
which means that in our case, this will be 32 cycles per one tick. This also means that our tick is 0 0.9 milliseconds. However, the system still thinks that this is one millisecond. What is the result? All timeouts in your system will expire prematurely. If the timeout is short, this will be hidden by the software overhead. But when the timeout becomes longer and longer, the difference will, be, will raise too, and we start to, not, uh, to see that. How to fix that problem? First, we can eliminate the ticks and use the hardware cycles directly inside the kernel. But this is not possible if practice. The Zephyr <coughs> also uh, supports the SOC with system timer counted in the hundred, uh, hundreds of megahertz. And for example, 32-bit integer on 200 megahertz machine spans to 21 seconds of time, which means that if you would like to use the uh, cycles to measure one minute, this is not possible on 32-bit representation, which we currently have. The second solution is to change the definition of the uh, tick. At the moment, we are specifying how many ticks we would like to have in one second. If we specify that, how many hardware cycles we would, like, uh, we would like to have in one tick, then the problem will disappear. So far, because this change is not done in the Zephyr, is being discussed, we have work around. We can carefully choose the configs clock uh, ticks per second value to basically ensure that one tick will be integer number of hardware cycles. But this will not solve all the problem. Let's do another example. Let's build a system with uh, 100 ticks per second. So every tick, 10 milliseconds of time is consumed. And all our, uh, uh, all our counters in the kernel just increases by 10 every tick. And everything is OK. However, you know, we have the hardware which have the fancy number of the hardware cycles per second, so we would like to mitigate that. So we set the ticks per second to 128. And now the, uh, the time represented inside the kernel is not, no longer uh, integer of milliseconds. And millisecond is the unit you uh, are using to communicate with the kernel. You cannot use any other unit right now. Which means that the same amount of time measured in, uh, using the kernel API will give you different results depending on the time when you start the measurement. And you see that on the picture. For example, tick one takes seven milliseconds according to the kernel, and tick two takes eight. Result, you basically cannot do on the time of the measurement using this kernel API because you never know if you have shorter or longer tick. How to fix the problem? We can do drastic change. We can use ticks instead of any artificial units in the kernel API and just leave all the time conversion to the application. This is a drastic change. But uh, if we don't do that, the only way to have precise time representation in the application is to use cycles directly. So this is just a few of the problems we have in the, in the Zephyr regarding the timeouts. And these problems are currently being addressed on the GitHub. So what we are trying to do is to change the whole idea of dealing with time with inside the uh, Zephyr, both from the uh, in, inside the kernel and on the kernel application boundary. First part of that is to allowing the application to choose the rounding for the unit conversion. 
And for that, uh, we, together with Intel, are proposing the new API, which allows you to convert the, between the time units, like ticks, microseconds, milliseconds, nanoseconds, etc., and choose the rounding mode. So are we going to floor? Are we going to sail? Are we going to find the nearest value? The next part, which we have to do, is to change the internal time representation on the Zephyr kernel. Because at the moment, the all time representation is just integer. And sineness and width of this integer depends on the person who wrote the code, which have some interesting side effects because some parts are using signed and doing the calculation on the signed integer, some other parts take this on the unsigned and so on. So what we're proposing is to basically create a new type intended to represent basically some time and use it in all, uh, all, uh, all the places in the kernel when some time is involved. At the moment, there are discussions if this type should be signed or not, because for some people, some people would like to represent the past events, and some people would like to, uh, would like to have longer uh, timeouts in the future. With the change of the internal representation, uh, we're also proposing the change of the external representation, the one you are using in the kernel API. What we identified, that we would like to specify the timeout in the way that we can use different units. Because from you as the user, the SI units, like milliseconds, second, and so on, are more convenient to use if you are uh, specifying just timeout. However, if you would like to measure some time, the ticks are better because then you control the conversion. Which means that we have to specify both value and the unit. The second part is the reference point. At the moment, all timeouts are scheduled from the now. The problem with now is that it might be not the now you're thinking about because you can get the interrupt, which takes some time, and you move your now. So what we're proposing we, is that we would like to specify the reference point. It can be still now, but it can be absolute time. If this would be absolute time, then you can easily schedule one event depending on the time when the other event happened. This helps us to solve the problem like in the Bluetooth because we are referencing some event which happened in the past, not the time when we are executing the code. And the last thing we would like to include in that structure is the clock source. At the moment, Zephyr uses uh, only one clock source, which is the system timer. And for us, in this, uh, uh, this is something which might be problematic. We are uh, targeting low power devices and we would like to use the best hardware suited for the task. With the current clock source, we are uh, taking as least power as possible, but the resolution of the timer is not the best. We have other timers in system. However, this will require higher frequency clock, and higher frequency clocks means more power. So we would like to include the include the type of the clock uh, and give the choose for the, uh, for the application developer to choose between the trite of between the power and precision and other uh, clock uh, properties, like for example, accuracy. We would like to do that change in the way that existing application will require minimal work to port, which means that current macros uh, will allow you to smooth transition. But this is not enough. If you would like to have the operating system, which is both easy to use and allow us to do the things like Bluetooth stack, when the time precision of the timeouts is really matter, we need you. As you've seen, the, the work involved uh, requires changing of the very very uh, basic principles of the operating system, and we can handle that.
but it also involved the change of the APIs, change of the time representations. And if you look in the code, you see that drivers for your SOCs are using the kernel API with some timeouts. You see that your application, network stacks, frameworks, etc., are, uh, are using that APIs, which means that the change we are trying to do will affect all of you. And this is why we would like to invite you to participate in the discussions about the direction of these changes. I show you some problems. I show you some very specific cases we are, are currently discussed, but there are much more. In the presented issues on the GitHub, you can uh, see other with similar, uh, uh, showing similar problems in different areas of the timeout handling. If you would like to talk about the better API for time conversion, there is already pull request with some discussions, for example, about this uh, value sign unsigned, about 64 bits and so on. And there is another pull request which shows you how we would like to change the uh, uh, representation of the timeout for the kernel interface. So these are things which are currently discussed in the Zephyr. We would like to have them included in some form in Zephyr 2.1 but without your help, even the minimal, like discussing the changes, or uh, let's say more demanding, like porting the, the various subsystem of the new API, this will be not possible. And with this message, I end this presentation and would like to say thank you. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Um, so, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, the new timeout specification type that you are proposing, um, it, it's a little more complex than a simple integer. How much overhead do you see that adding to the, uh, to the, to the timeout API calls in general? Uh, the structure we are proposing uh, has to fit in 64 bits because syscalls cannot pass the structure as a value at the moment, but we can pass 64-bit values, which means that the, everything I mentioned in the presentation have to fit in 64 bits. And we already do the benchmarking uh, about the both size and uh, uh, speed difference in the current 32-bit and the proposed scheme. Uh, on typical application, you will see like less than 1% of increase of the Cs on the, of the size and uh, almost uh, n uh, almost uh, not visible uh, change of the uh, of the uh, performance unless your hardware has some troubles with 64 bits and 64 bits operations are expensive expensive another questions If not, thank you very much.